Heraclitus. Allegories of Homer. Homer's Allegories on the Gods. Homeric Problems 1. Homer is brought to a colossal and fierce trial, for his irreverence towards the divinity. Everything about him is impiety if nothing is allegorical. Sacrilegious tales, a tissue of blasphemous follies display their delirium through the two poems. If all philosophical view is absent, if no allegorical meaning is underlying and this poetry should be understood as ordinary poetry, Homer is a Samania or a Tantalus, who does not know how to hold his tongue, a most honorable disease. For my part, one thing intrigues me a lot. How are people who live in fear of the divinity, who frequent temples and shrines, attentive all year round to celebrate the feasts of the gods, can they show such tenderness for these impious works of Homer, and sing these cursed stories by court? From the most tender age, to the naive mind of the child who f have his first studies, Homer is given as a nurse. It is just if, as soon as the swimsuit, we do not make our souls suck the milk of his worms. We all have it with us at our beginnings and during the years when man little by little is being formed. It flourishes during our middle age. Not once until old age does he not inspire us the least disgust. Scarcely have we left him than we thirst for him again. One can say that his trade only ends with the old. Homeric problems too. This is, I think, a very clear proof and for all evident. The verses of Homer are neither strewn nor tainted with any immoral narrative. Pure and virgin of all stain is the voice that the Iliad first and after her the Odyssey both raise in concert to proclaim their pious feelings, I would not fight against one of the blessed. Children, what folly to be equal to Zeus, what holy majesty the poet's verses give to Zeus, in the heavens, he who sets everything in motion with an imperceptible movement of the head. And Poseidon, here he is rushing forward, and suddenly we hear the great mountain and the woods shudder. The same for Hera. Shaking on her throne, she makes their sound in the distance vast Olympus. Similarly, at the appearance of Athena, Achilles, amazed, turns round, immediately he recognizes Pallas, the divine Athena. Her eyes shine, terrible. When the goddess with the bow, Artemis, runs the mountains, all along the Tegete, or plays on the Erymanthus, among the wild boars and the light hinds. This way of speaking of the gods, and of all the gods also, with all due solemnity, should more examples be cited. Eternals blessed with immortal thoughts or again, by Zeus, who give us the goods and whose life is only joy. Not eating bread, not drinking wine, the color of fire, they do not have our blood, they are immortals. Homeric Problems 3. Who then dares to call Homer ungodly? Illustrious Zeus, most high, inhabitant of ether and dark clouds, you, sun, who sees all, who, likewise, hear all, you, rivers, and you, earth, and you dead from below, who punish humans guilty of perjury, be witnesses the pious intentions of Homer. Everything he attributes to the gods is exceptionally beautiful, and is he not also a divine being? If there are people who, through ignorance, do not understand language allegorical of Homer, who did not know how to penetrate the arcana of his wisdom, who are unable to discern the truth and reject it, who do not understand the philosophical meaning of a myth and become attached. Appearances of fiction, may these people clear our way. For us, who have performed holy ablutions and are pure, let us follow, under the guidance of our two poems, in the footsteps of the august truth. Homeric Problems 4. Honest be Plato, flatterer altogether and detractor of Homer, Plato who drives out of his republic this illustrious exile, after having crowned him with white bands of wool, after having spread over his head of rich scents. We will not dwell further on Epicurus, the man who cultivates in his gardens this voluptuousness without grandeur, the man who wants to free himself in block from all poetry and sees in his fables only a bait for perdition. Before these characters, it is indeed the case to repeat with a big sigh, ah, misery. Listen to mortals questioning the gods. And the saddest thing is that both drew from Homer the principles of their doctrine. The teacher to whom they owe most of their knowledge, they show him nothing but ungodly ingratitude. But we will have the opportunity to speak again of Epicurus and Plato. Homeric Problems 5. For the moment it is perhaps necessary to give some brief explanations of a technical nature on the allegory, 
as well, the word, very exactly chosen, almost by itself indicates the meaning of the thing. In fact, we call an allegory a figure which consists in speaking of one thing when we want to designate a completely different second. Archilochus, for example, engaged in the perils of the struggle against the Thracians, compares the war to the raging waves, roughly in these terms, look, Glaucos, on the sea of deep waters, here are the waves swirling, around the peaks of Gire, a cloud rises, straight ahead, a sign of a storm, and suddenly fear takes hold of us. We also find welcome allegories in the poet of Mytilene. He likewise compares the troubles of tyranny to a sea stirred by a storm. I do not understand anything about these rising winds. Sometimes the wave breaks from here and sometimes from there. And we, right in the middle, are carried away on our black ship, severely shaken by the great storm. Here is the water covering the foot of the mast. The whole canopy is in pieces, crisscrossed with vast tears. And the anchors are crazy. At first glance, this painting, which transports us to the sea, suggests that it is about sailors frightened by the storm. But no, is it Mersal? That the poet wants to designate and the conspiracy he raised to impose tyranny on Mytilene. He said the same somewhere else, alluding to the acts of this Mersal. It is like the wave which, higher than the preceding ones, rises and will give us great difficulty to empty the water, when it has invaded the sea ship. This poet, inhabitant of an island, is full of allegories drawn from the sea, and most often he compared the calamities provoked by tyrants to the storms of the open sea. For his part, Anacreon of Teos, wanting to stigmatize the insolence and the pride of a haughty courtesan, resorts, to depict this recalcitrant humor, to the allegory of the runaway. This is what he writes, Cavail of Thrace, why look at me askance, why flee from me, cruel? Do you think I am devoid of, spirit? Know that I could very well pass you the bit, and the reins in hand, make you turn at the limit of the terminals, in the quarry. If, for the moment, you graze the lawn, and cheek while, bouncing, lightly, it is because a skillful horseman did not straddle you by breaking the bridle to you. I would not finish listing in detail all the allegories that one meets with poets or prose writers. It only takes a few examples to get an idea of the whole question. But Homer himself, is it not true that we find the allegory in him in the form of doubtful, sporadic, and still contested examples? He offers us a very clear case of this mode of expression in the verses in which Ulysses, enumerating the misfortunes brought about by war and battles, says, Bronze spreads there upon the earth much straw and little grain, when it comes to tilting the scales of Zeus, here, we talk about agriculture but we think of battle. In short, we make what we want to say heard by means of completely different evocations. Homeric Problem 6. Allegory is therefore a common figure among writers and one that Homer himself was not unaware of. Why, then, when it seems to us to get lost in connection with the gods, not to have recourse, to justify it, to this remedy. The order that I will follow in my presentation is the very order of the Homeric poems. A learned and subtle commentary will show, in each song, the allegories on the gods, which always seeks to smear and denigrate, did not even spare the beginning of the first song. She repeats over and over again, about Apollo's anger. The Greeks, perfectly irresponsible, are decimated by the dashes that the god throws indiscriminately, and his anger is so unjust, that the offender of Crises, Agamemnon, is not specially struck, he, the culprit, who deserved to be punished. But those who had shouted out loud to him, treat the priest with honor by accepting the splendid ransom, are victims in his stead of his stupidity and his stubbornness. For my part, I have carefully scrutinized these verses and the hidden truth they contain, and I think this is not the wrath of Apollo, but an epidemic of plague. Of a plague which was not sent by the gods, but came by itself, evil having arisen, this time like so many others, to devour, it still does in our time, lives human. That Apollo is the same as the sun, that it is a single god under two different names, it is clear from the secret revelations that are made about the gods in the mystery ceremonies and the popular chorus proclaims it will, in all tones, the sun is Apollo, and Apollo is the sun. Homeric Problem 7. This has been demonstrated with precision by Apollodorus, historian of universal competence. 
I do not want to expand further on this topic. These would be irrelevant and excessively long developments, which I want to skip over. But what needs to be explained in support of our conjecture, I will not omit. It is a question of showing that, for Homer too, Apollo merges with the sun. This emerges. We will be convinced of this if we want to take a closer look, from all the qualifiers used. This is how the poet continually calls him Phoebus, and this name, by Zeus, does not come from Phoebe, the mother of Leto, according to tradition, because if Homer commonly uses surnames, we never find in him from qualifiers taken from the name of the mother. He therefore calls Apollo Phoebus, brilliant, for the brilliance of his rays, what only suits the sun, he attributes it similarly to Apollo. As for Echaigos, it is hardly probable that this name is linked to Echerge, the one who, from the land of the Hyperboreans, brought the first fruits to Delos. No, but the god is really Hekaigos, the one which operates at a distance. That is to say, the sun, which is placed far from our earth, stands up there, making the appropriate seasons hatch at the right time, balancing heat and frost, plowing and sowing, harvesting and other work in the fields. It is he who is the artisan among men. Homer still calls him Lycogene, not that he was born in Lycia. This is a recent, unknown myth of Homer, but likewise, I imagine, that he calls the day Erinyea, the one that produces the morning, that is to say the dawn, in the same way he calls the sun Lycogene, because it is the true cause of the light which remains, in clear weather, at dusk, or else because he is the author of the Lycabas, of the year. It is in fact the sun that puts an end to the length of the year when it has gone through the twelve signs of the zodiac. He also calls him Chrysaure, not that he wears a golden sword on his belt, it is a weapon which does not suit him very much, since he is an archer, but as its light, in the east, looks perfectly like gold, when we look at it, we have found that, Chrysaure, is a very appropriate epithet for the sun and its rays. From this comes, I imagine, that, in the combat of the gods, Poseidon stands up, in front of him, like antagonist, since always an incredible enmity opposed fire and water, the fate having assigned to these two elements of a contrary nature. This is why Poseidon, humid element, and whose name comes from Parsis, drink, is the adversary of the scorching rays of the sun. Otherwise, would he have any special reason to blame Apollo? Homeric Problems 8. These explanations will suffice. They allowed me, I suppose, to show the identity of Apollo and the sun. But what was it to establish? That in epidemics plague the main cause of the plague is the sun. When the summer that it gives us, lukewarm and sweet, enjoys a peaceful heat, thanks to the moderate radiance of the star, it is like a light of life which smiles on men. But when the summer is dry and hot, it causes unhealthy vapors to rise from the ground, and the organisms, tired and sick as a result of this unexpected change which has taken place in the surrounding air, succumb to the attacks of the plague. But the epidemics, Homer attributes them to Apollo. He who makes this god responsible for sudden deaths by name, he says in fact, the god with the silver bow, whom Artemis accompanies, Apollo, slaughters them with his most gentle arrows. So, since the sun and Apollo are one for Homer, and since, moreover, this kind of plague is caused by the sun, the poet attributed the plague to Apollo as its physical cause. That the season where this plague epidemic hit the Greeks was indeed summer, that is what I will now try to decide. And I will have shown at the same time that the event is not attributable to the anger of Apollo, but to a spontaneous corruption of the atmosphere. The length of the days, which is at its maximum, immediately proves that, we are in the heart of summer, when the days are long. From the exploits of Agamemnon to the coming out of Achilles unarmed, only one day passes, and yet it is not entirely completed, only most of it is consumed. The big eyed goddess, the venerable Hera, unwillingly returns the sun tirelessly over the ocean. Hera scrapped the remaining hours, and I think there were still quite a few left. Homeric Problems 9 The actions that take place in the interval occupy eight songs. The first is the combat in the plain with many exploits, on one side as on the other. Then comes the fight near the Greek wall. Thirdly, the fight near the vessels, until the removal of the corpse of Patroclus, which causes the exit of Achilles. 
Such a large number of actions would be improbable if it weren't for summer. And the nights are not in the least winter nights. How dare Hector, in freezing cold, to spend the night near the Achaean ships. Nor would one hear the sound of pipes and flutes joyfully resound in the barbarian army. A warm bed and camps are provided for the warriors in winter. They don't have to fight in the open air. Hector would not have left the city, where he could take refuge and remain in safety, to establish his troops without shelter by the sea. And how can we admit that all the allies who came to the Trojans were adventurous enough to come, in the bad season, line up against the enemy, especially at the foot of Ida, a mountain with a harsh climate, which gives rise to impassable rivers. From its various sides derive the Ressos, Heptopor, Caresios, Rodios, then the Granicus as well as the Esipus, the divine Scamander, finally the Simwar, who, even without the rains falling from the sky, were able to turn the plain into a swamp. Let us even suppose that the barbarians, out of unconsciousness, could have chosen to do what was contraindicated. But the Greeks, of superior intelligence in all areas, how come they choose the best among them to send them, at night, for observation? Would the expected benefit, if successful, therefore be large enough to compensate for the loss incurred in the event of failure? It is that a simple snowfall and a heavy rainstorm could easily have overwhelmed the two scouts. I also believe that the simple exit of the Trojans out of their town to fight is a sign that it is summer and not another season. In winter, always, the war stops. The two parties make a truce, because the men can neither bear arms, nor bow to military tasks. Pursuing or evading the adversary would not be easy. And how would the hands know how to direct the blows with precision, under the numbness of the cold? No, it's in the middle of summer that the troops go to war. And to realize that it is indeed so, we have, not mere probabilities, but striking proofs. Homeric Problems 10. Following Agamemnon's maneuver testing his army, all the Greeks get up and run to their ships from under the vessels they are the props. They certainly have neither headwinds nor a threatening sea. Otherwise, who would want to serve as a pilot for people running like this in the face of certain danger? And who are also preparing to make an important crossing? They were not simply leaving for Tenedos. They were not setting off for a short trip to Lesbos and Chios. Greece was far away, and the sea full of pitfalls, since even in summer we saw sailors sinking there. Another thing, on their way, to the vessels, out of the assembly, they stir up an abundance of dust, with loud cries they run towards the knaves, and their feet make the dust fly. And how would it be, if the ground was wet? In the battles that will follow, Homer has the habit of repeating over and over again, thus become white the torsos of the Argians, the feet of their horses raising the dust which towards the copper sky rises in great whirlpools. And when Sarpedon is wounded, does not Boreas' breath come to refresh his exhausted soul, his body claiming a little freshness, in this burning air? Elsewhere still, we see them, by thirst, dried up and covered with dust, quenching their sweat and drinking to calm their desiccating thirst. These are things that could not happen in winter, relief for men fighting in summer. What is the use of extending so long? It would almost suffice a single proof among those we have given, to show which season it is, he burns abalone, willow and tamarisk, as well as the lotus, the tiger nuts and the rush. Homeric Problems 11. If we admit that the time in question is indeed summer, that this summer season is the one in which diseases break out, and that plague epidemics are the responsibility of Apollo, how can we not think that the event in question does not come from divine anger, but from atmospheric circumstances? It is Herodicus's idea, and it is very likely, that the Greeks did not remain before Troy for the entire ten years, but that they arrived there at the expiration of the period fixed by fate. For the taking of the city, it would be strange, indeed, if knowing, according to the predictions of Calchas, that they would take the tenth year, the great city, they would have spent, for nothing, so much, years of inaction. It is more probable that, in the meantime, they will have to come and go along the coasts of Asia, to train themselves in war work and to fill their camp with booty, and when the tenth year came, the data signed by lot for the taking of Ilion, they assembled and moved there. They established themselves in a low-lying basin, on a marshy ground, 
So, in summer, the plague assailed them. Homeric problems 12. Let us now examine the various details given on disease. Almost all of them will fit our theory. And the first, this voice which rises from the arrows covers a physical phenomenon. This is not, by Zeus, a fantastic story of sound arrows. This verse has a philosophical content. It is full of anger, and on his back, when he leaps, the arrows sound. In fact, there are melodious sounds in the sky full of harmony, produced by the eternal movement of the spheres, and especially when the course of the sun is tense, while a flexible wand, hitting the air at random, or a stone thrown at the slingshot produces a rustling and hissing sound that resonates so loudly, how can we imagine that such large masses, in the momentum of their revolutions from sunrise to sunset, can roll their chariot in silence, to travel the formidable route assigned to them. These sounds which constantly echo in the sky, we do not perceive them, either because we are accustomed to them since our earliest childhood, or because the immeasurable distance which separates us from them makes all noise vanish in space. That everything will go well thus, Plato himself is guarantor, he who banishes Homer from his republic. In addition, at the top of the circles of the latter, the spindle of the world, on each one, stood a siren, turning with her circle and emitting a particular sound in a particular tone, and all these notes, eight in number, formed a harmonious accord. Likewise Alexander of Ephesus, explaining the regulated march of the wandering stars, planets, he adds about the sounds they emit, and all of them make a concert whose harmony recalls a heptachord lyre, on his neighbor each one goes up an interval. All this shows clearly that the world is neither silent nor silent. Homeric Problems 13. And it is in Homer that we find the first mention of this truth, when he allegorically calls the rays of the sun arrows and adds that these rays, crossing the air, made a particular voice heard, a divine voice. After these general notations concerning sounds, he immediately moves on to the peculiarities of his subject by adding, he advances like the night. The sun that Homer presents to us here does not emit an absolutely pure light, it is mixed with a black fog. The poet has veiled his light from night, from that same night, one might say, which, during epidemics of the plague, usually intercepts the light of day. In addition, how to explain this? Apollo, who began to shoot from the bow, positions himself away from the vessels and launches a first shot. The silver arc makes a terrible sound. If he was acting out of anger, the archer should have stood near the people to be reached. But like the poet hears about, allegorically, the sun, he quite rightly supposed that the star sends its pestilential rays from afar. Homeric problems 14. Also, he brings another very clear indication, when he says, first of all it reaches the mules and the good running dogs. Apollo would not have thus spent his anger without discernment and impure loss on animals without reason. His fury would not have been launched blindly on mules and on dogs, whatever thinks it, by standing here against Homer, the miserable slave of Thrace, I mean Zoil of Amphipolis, who throws it wrong and through nonsense and nonsense of this kind. Homer, an excellent connoisseur of the things of nature, describes here what usually happens in epidemics of plague, the experiments of medicine and philosophy have recognized, thanks to careful observation, that in epidemics of plague plague, the evil begins by striking the quadrupeds, Two very plausible reasons explain why these animals are the most exposed to the plague. First, the regularity of their diet is suspended from their hunting and for this reason they eat and drink without measure until they have a full stomach, to die for, without reason being able to put a break on their gluttony. The second reason is even more true. Men breathe in a higher layer of the atmosphere. The air they breathe in is cleaner, they are not so quickly affected by the epidemic. The animals on the other hand move at ground level and more easily collect all the unhealthy exhalations. The poet also quite rightly shows us that the plague ends, not at the end of an even number of days, but at the end of an odd number, for nine days the features of the god riddle the army. It has been perfectly recognized, having experienced it in various diseases, that the critical day is an odd day. Homeric Problems 15 it is Achilles who puts an end to the plague, Achilles whose master was Chiron, the best of the centaurs, 
who perfectly possessed all science, who excelled in medicine, since he had known, it is said, Asclepios. But to the healer Achilles, the poet deputy the goddess Hera, allegory designating a force of nature, the goddess with white arms, Hera, has just put this thought to her heart. According to physicists, there are two pneumatic elements, which are breaths, ether and air. We call the first Zeus, it is the igneous essence, and the second, Hera, it is the air, more tender element, hence feminine. But we will explain ourselves in detail on this a little later. For the moment, let us be satisfied to say that the air, previously cloudy, having cleared, the plague in question was suddenly reabsorbed. It is not out of fancy that the poet calls Hera, Hera with white arms. It is in accordance with the facts. The fog, like the night, has been illuminated and purified by the air to white light. Delivered from the scourge, the Greek troops follow the path that is usually taken in cases of deliverance. They think of what are called sacrifices to avert misfortune and of purifications. All are purified and will then throw to the sea their defilements. Homeric Problems 16 It seems to me that Ulysses, for his part, does not invoke the help of any god other than the sun, during the sacrifice he offers, and throughout the day, to appease the god, the sons of the Achaeans, sing, when the sun goes down and night comes, they will all lie down next to the moorings. The sunset marks the end of acts of piety. The god was honored as long as he could hear and see. Now that he can no longer attend the ceremonies, we stop the party. At daybreak, when they have taken to sea, here is what Homer adds, Apollo, who acts from afar, sends them a propitious wind and humid anxious to show the special intervention of the sun. In fact, as long as the sun, still without fire or flames, has not bent its course towards the south, the freshness of the dew which has humidified the atmosphere makes the breaths, at dawn, weak and indistinct. From then on, it was the sun that pushed their ship straight ahead, sending them an efficient wind, the wind which blows following the humidity. Here then is a first clear allegory. We have shown that it is not a question of a gratuitous anger of Apollo, but of the learned transcription of a phenomenon of nature. Homeric Problems 17. Let us pass immediately to the appearance of Athena to Achilles. While from the scabbard, he, draws his great blade, Athena comes to him from the depths of the sky. It is Hera who sends him, the goddess with white arms, who lovingly watches over both leaders. Standing behind Achilles, she grabs the Pelide's blonde hair. Visible to him alone, it escapes the gaze of all other men. Achilles, stunned, turns around. Immediately he recognizes Pallas, the divine Athena. His eyes shine, terrible. The first thing to notice, it is that the goddess occurs while Achilles draws the sword. With a speed which has no equal, she leaves the abode of the heavens to come to prevent the murder. With a very pictorial gesture, she grasps Achilles' hair from behind with a firm hand. These notions hide a dazzling and extremely deep knowledge, expressing it in allegorical form. And here again Plato, the same who in his Republic shows himself so ungrateful to Homer, can be convinced, by these lines, of having stolen from the poet his theory on the soul. Plato distinguishes in the soul two generic elements, the reasonable element and the element that he calls unreasonable. He further subdivides the unreasonable part into two specific elements, he calls the first the epithematicon, and the second the thymoidae. And he even gives them a kind of abode for each of them. He assigned them a stay inside the body, the reasonable part of the soul occupies according to him, like an acropolis, the highest place of the head, and all the senses form a circle and stand guard around of her. For the unreasonable part, the thymus dwells around the heart, passionate desires in faith. Plato assimilates these three parts of the soul, in an allegory of Phaedrus, to horses and a coachman. Here are his own words. The first of the two horses, whose condition is the better, has an upright bearing and is well decoupled. It has a high neckline, a slightly curved chamfer line. He is white with black eyes. He is in love with glory with moderation and reserve. Companion of opinion. No need to hit him. We lead him with orders and simply by talking to him. So much for the first of these elements of the soul. Here is for the other, the second is askew, 
massive, badly built, the neckline thick, neck massive, command mask, black coat, grey eyes, rather bloody, companion of excess and glory, ears full of hair, almost deaf, obeyed with difficulty the whip and the strokes of the sting. As for the reasonable part of the soul, which he placed in the head, Plato made it the driver of the whole team and he speaks of it in these terms. Regarding the species of soul which is the main one in us, the following remark must be made. The God gave it to each of us as a divine genius. This is the principle which we have said remains in the highest part of our body. However, we can say very truly that this soul raises us above the earth because of its affinity with the sky, because we are a plant not terrestrial, but celestial. Homeric Problems 18. Plato drew all this from the source of the Homeric poems, and derived this current towards his dialogues. Let us first look at the unreasonable parts of the soul. That the thymus has its seat in the region of the heart, is what Ulysses makes clear when, in his anger against the suitors, he strikes on his heart as if there were the seat of hatred against the wicked, but smiting his breast, he consumed his heart. Patience, my heart. It is much worse bitch that we had to endure in the past. The organ from which the waves of anger originate, it is to him that this discourse is addressed. His body where he had begun to think about evil, a couple of vultures, perched on both sides, tore his liver. He had assaulted the companion of Zeus, this august Leto. The legislators cut off the hand that struck his father, they thus cut off the very member who carried out the criminal act. Similarly Homer does chastise in his faith the one who, by the liver, commits an ungodly act. On the unreasonable parts of the soul, then, these are Homer's philosophical data. Homeric Problems 19. It remains for us to find out where is the seat of the reasonable part. Now it is the head, which, for Homer, holds in the body the most eminent rank. Hence the custom, with the poet, to designate the whole man by specifically naming this part, the most noble, which includes all the rest, because of these weapons, this head today is the prey of the earth, this head, that is to say Ajax about the horse of Nestor, the poet shows even more clearly that this is a capital portion of the body, at the precise point from which the mane planted in the horse's skulls leaves. Terrible are the blows struck in this place. Now Homer confirms this truth with an allegory, in what he tells us about Athena. Achilles, full of anger, threw himself on his sword. He has allowed reason to cloud his head by the anger that agitates his chest, but soon his reason sobered him up, tore him from this grip, brought him back to a better state. This conversion with the help of reason is what the Homeric poems quite rightly identify with Athena. For, more or less, the name of this goddess is nothing other than an appellation of intelligence, since she is like a seer, and she penetrates all things with her eyes if purposes of reasoning. And this explains why it was kept a virgin. Intelligence is indeed incorruptible forever and no soiling cannot make it dirty. And that is also why it is born from the head of Zeus. We have seen that this part of the body is properly the mother of ideas. Homeric Problems 20. What is the use of stretching? Athena is the perfect embodiment of wisdom. Following these outbreaks of anger in Achilles' heart, behold, as if to extinguish the evil, a remedy arises and seizes the blonde hair of the Pelade. As long as he remains angry, Thymios, anger, is installed in his chest, while he draws the sword, his heart remains undecided in his male chest. But when anger subsides, when reasonable ideas have partially taken possession of his mind, already as if won over to repentance, wisdom without letting go any longer holds its head. Achilles, is, amazed. His coolness and his impassivity in the face of danger are frightening to see repentance born of reflection. And realizing the abyss into which he had almost rolled, before the appearance of reason he recoils, as in front of a driver. It is therefore that he has not completely recovered from his anger. Here is the rest. Use only words, water him with insults, tell him what awaits him. A goddess, pushing her help to the limit, would have succeeded to this disturbance in total pacification. But as it is a matter of human reason, it does the essential by removing the sword, the audacity to reach the point of assault is destroyed but there are still traces of anger. 
it is not at once and on the instant that one can cut off the great irritations of the sensibility. So, with regard to Athena, whom the poet makes intervene as mediator in order to calm Achilles' anger against Agamemnon, one will admit that this falls under the purest allegory. Homeric Problems 21. But here is a most serious grievance against Homer and which deserves the worst condemnation. If the story he tells is really like what we can read a little further on, when he speaks of the ruler of the universe, that the other Olympians claimed to link, all, Hera, Poseidon and Pallas Athena. But you came to him, you did it, you, goddess, to escape the bonds, by hailing towards the vast Olympus, promptly the giant with the hundred arms, which carries with the gods the name of Briare, and that of Aegon near all the men, his strength is greater than that of his father. For these lines, Homer does not only deserve to be driven out of the Republic of Plato, we must exile it beyond the distant columns known as of Hercules and the impassable ocean sea. Indeed, Zeus does not feel the chains, and those responsible for the plot are neither the Titans nor the daring giants of Pallene. It is Hera, who is twice united to her, by bonds of blood and those of marriage. It is his brother Poseidon, who received his portion of the universe in all fairness and has no reason to blame to the greed of Zeus, for having been robbed of his share of honor. Thirdly, it is Athena, whose revolt is a double impiété. The one she assails is both her father and her mother. I also consider the way in which Zeus is saved even more unseemly than the way in which he is attacked. It is Thetis and Briareus who avoid his chains, he is unworthy to place his hopes in this way, in order to have to resort to similar allies. Homeric Problems 22. To ward off this impiety, there is only one remedy, to show that history is an allegory. And in fact, it is the primordial substance, principle of all beings, which is presented as a god in these verses. The notions of physics on the elements, Homer is the initiator and Homer alone. He is the master of all those who came after him and the inspiration of all the theories which they seem to discover. Take Thales of Miletus, we admit that he was the first to place, at the origin of the universe, water as a primitive element, the liquid substance, in fact, docile to any imprint, knows how to take the forms the most varied. The part of the water which evaporates gives the air, and the most subtle emanation of the air ignites, becoming ether. The water, by condensing, by turning into mud, ends up giving the earth. So Thales declared that, for the whole of the four elements, water plays in some the role of element and final cause. But who is the true father of this opinion? Isn't it Homer, when he said, Ocean, father of all beings? Did he not quite rightly name the liquid element ocean? A word which has just flowed quickly and made this ocean the source and origin of all things. Anaxagoras of Clazomenes, disciple and successor of Thales, added earth as a second element to water, so that the mixture of dry and wet gives, from opposite substances, a well-melted and very homogeneous whole. But this is yet another piece of land that Homer cleared above all else. And it was he who generously provided Anaxagoras with the first seeds of his theory, where he said, Ah! All become a little bit of earth and water again. Any body that corrupts itself resolves itself to the different elements that gave birth to it. It seems that nature is claiming its debt and taking back at the end what it lent at the beginning. So Euripides writes, echoing the philosopher of Clazomene, everything returns to its starting point, what the earth gave birth returns to the earth, what owed its birth to the germs of the ether returns to the ether. To curse the Greeks, Homer therefore found the only truly philosophical imprecation. He wished them to become water and earth again, to resolve themselves to the very elements from which they were formed at their birth. In the final analysis, the greatest philosophers have brought the number of the elements to the perfect number of four. Two of them, they explain, are material, water and earth. Two are, spiritual, the air and ethyl. These substances, which oppose each other, agree when mixed together. Homeric Problems 23. But if we want to be sincere, don't we find these elements in Homer's philosophy? Let us leave the chain of Hera, allegory which marks the order of succession of the four elements, we will come back to this later. For the moment, we only need the oaths of Song 3 to confirm our thesis, 
illustrious Zeus, most high, inhabitant of ether and dark clouds, you, sun, who sees everything, who also understand everything, you rivers, and you, earth, and you who, under the ground, punish those of the dead who have perjured themselves. He first invokes the infinitely subtle ether, the highest placed, pure fire is, I think, substance the highest. This fire, I imagine, is Zeus with such a just name either he derives this name from the fact that he gives life, v, to men, or that he owes it to his flaming and boiling nature, Kuli. Euripides, precisely, speaks of this ether extended over all the rest. Do you see up there this limitless ether, surrounding the earth with its supple arms? Believe it's Zeus, hold it for God. Ether, the first substance, is therefore invoked as the arbiter of oaths. Rivers and earth, the material elements, follow on from this primordial essence ether. By Hades from below, the poet allegorically designates air. This element, in fact, is black, no doubt because it has inherited a greater density and a certain humidity. Also, in the absence of any source of light, it is devoid of any glow, and the poet was right to call it the invisible. But why the sun, in the fifth place? It was to give some satisfaction to the peripatetic philosophers that Homer invoked him. According to the theory which they support, it is necessary to consider as distinct from fire this substance which they name substance with circular motion, and which they admit is the fifth element. While the ether, because of its lightness, occupies the highest regions of space, the sun, the moon and each of the stars which follow the same revolution rotate endlessly in a circular motion and do not have the same properties as the igneous substance. Homer therefore wanted to make us understand by these different beings the elements which are the primary source of nature. Homeric Problems 24. And let no one come and tell us about him. Why call the ether Zeus? Why name the air Hades, and obscure, with these symbolic names, his philosophical thought? It is not surprising that a poet resorts to allegory, as long as professional philosophers use this figure. Thus the somber Heraclitus exposes the divine secrets of nature in an obscure form and accessible to our representation through images, when he said, Gods, mortals, men, immortals, living the death of the first, dying their life, and elsewhere, we descend in the same rivers and do not descend, we are there and are not. All that he says about nature is thus presents in the form of enigmatic allegories. And what about empedocles of Agrigento? When he wants us to understand that there are four elements, does he not reproduce Homer's allegory? Brilliant Zeus, nurturing Hera, Adonius, and Nestus, who bathes the mortal source with tears. What he calls Zeus is ether. Hera is earth, Idone is air, and the mortal spring bathed in tears is water. Recourse to allegorical names, to see an author who claims to be a poet using allegory on a par with philosophers. Homeric Problems 25. It remains for us to examine whether the revolt against Zeus is not a recapitulation of these elements, if the poet does not rather consider things from the angle of physics. Now this is what the best philosophers say about the conditions for the duration of the universe, as long as Ha reign, without any spirit of quarrel, over the four elements, that none of them rises above the others, that each one keeps with discipline the rank which is assigned to him, all remains in peace. But if one of the elements succeeds in triumphing, imposes its tyranny and extends beyond its sphere, all the others, upset, will have to give in by necessity to the violence of the strongest. If the fire suddenly bursts into flames, it will be a general conflagration of the universe. If the water suddenly bursts in, it will be the end of the world by flood. Now, in the verses in question, Homer wants to let us hear some threat of revolution in the universe. Zeus, the most powerful, is the victim of a plot on the part of the other elements, Hera, the air, Poseidon, the liquid substance, Athena, the earth, is she not in fact the great demiurge of the universe, the worker goddess? These elements, therefore, are first united as parents because of their intermingling within each other. Then confusion almost set in between them, but the help of providence intervened. This providence, Homer rightly calls it Thetis, for it is she who has assumed the happy conservation of the universe, by forcibly maintaining each element in its law. 
she had for auxiliary her power with vigorous and innumerable arms, patients of this size, how to cure them, without considerable strength. So this ungodly chain of Zeus, so-called grievance without escape, is the allegorical exposition of natural phenomena. Homeric Problems 26. But Homer is also attacked in connection with Hephaestus thrown from heaven. First because the poet presents him to us lame and thus mutilates the divine nature, then because he puts him on the verge of death. I fell, he said, all day. At sunset, I landed at Lemnos, I was half dead. Here again Homer contains a hidden and philosophical meaning. These are not their fictions of a poet who, to amuse his audience, stages, without looking further, a lame Hephaestus. It is not a question here of the son that the fable gives to Zeus and Hera. Tell similar stories on gods would be really indecent. But fire comes under a double essence. The fire of the ether, as we said earlier, occupies the highest area of space and lacks nothing to be perfect. The fire here below, attached to the earth, is subject to destruction and the return to itself at every moment must revive it. This is why Homer always gives to the most subtle flame the name of sun or Zeus, while he calls Hephaestus the fire of the earth, which kindles and goes out. Commonly, consequently, by comparing our fire to this fire from above, infinitely perfect, we have rightly considered that it was lame. And this is all the more true since every cripple of the legs needs a stick to strengthen its march, and that our earth fire would be incapable of sustaining itself if we did not add wood. He was therefore called lame, pictorially. Moreover, in other places, Homer declares no longer allegorically but in proper terms that the fire is Hephaestus. On a spit then threading the offal, they are presented to the fire, Leta. To Hephaestus, he says by metaphor that the entrails are roasted by Hephaestus. In addition, he represents Hephaestus thrown from the top of the sky. This is a physical phenomenon. At the beginning, when the use of fire was not yet common, men succeeded in capturing, over time, the sparks coming from the celestial regions, using appropriate instruments which they placed facing the sun at the time noon. From this, no doubt, also comes the belief that Prometheus steals fire from heaven. It is indeed the foresight of man, his ingenuity which imagined making the fire descend from above. Nor is it without reason that the poet gives Lemnos is the first to receive the fire from heaven. In this place, in fact, spontaneously spurt out the flames of a fire that one would almost believe to have sprung from the earth. And what Homer then adds clearly shows that this is clearly visible fire. I was half dead. It withers and in fact extinguishes immediately, if it does not meet a provident hand capable of preserving it. Homeric Problems 27. This is how the myth of Hephaestus should be interpreted philosophically. I do not want to dwell here because it is a Baroque story, to the theory of Crates. Zeus, according to him, would have undertaken one day to measure the universe using two torches animated by a equal speed, Hephaestus and Helios. To judge the dimensions of the world, he launched the first from above, from the place the poet calls the threshold of Olympus, and let the second travel through space from sunrise to sunset. Both had the same time, and this is what explains this passage. At the same time as the sun was setting, Hephaestus fell to Lemnos however it may be, and he it is Zeus measuring the world or, what is more exact, an allegory representing the handing over to men of the fire here below, Homer is not guilty of any impiety on the account of Hephae TOS. Homeric Problems 28. At the second song, when the Greeks are going to take to the sea again, in front of Ulysses perplexed, a character stands up. It is nothing other than divine wisdom named by Homer Athena. As for Iris, Zeus envoy and messenger, she represents the discourse which speaks just as Hermes is the discourse which explains. They are two messengers of the gods, whose name does not designate anything other than the verbal translation of the thought. But isn't it indecent that Aphrodite pushes Helen into Alexander's arms? We do not take care that the poet designates by this term the madness of amorous passions which is always the go-between and the handmaid of the desires of youth. She has found the place she needs, from which she will advance the seat of Helena, from where, by various spells, she will excite the love in each of them, while Alexander is still in love. But that Helena begins to change her dispositions. 
This one, in fact, refuses at first and gives in at the end. Divided between two feelings. Love for Alexander and shame for memory of Menelaus. Homeric Problems 29. As for Hebe, who can be seen serving at feasts from the start, what can she be if not youth continually in bliss? In heaven there is no such thing as old age. The divine nature has nothing to do with this supreme disease of life. For any quality joy, the essential condition, in a way, is that the people gathered to take pleasure in the prime of their lives. For Eris, there is nothing mysterious about the allegory and no great finesse is needed to penetrate it. Homer explains himself openly here. Who, at first small, suddenly rises up and here her forehead strikes the sky, while with her feet she treads the earth. Homer in these verses does not evoke a monstrous divinity, whose size would undergo in both directions incredible transformations, which sometimes would be lying on earth, very small, and sometimes would have reached boundless greatness ether. But he wanted to represent, in this allegory, what always happens in quarrels. Discord indeed begins for trivial reasons, but once excited, it swells until it becomes a really big evil. Homeric Problems 30. Up to now, perhaps, the tone has been quite moderate. But Homer's slanderers make quite a tragedy for him, quite foolishly, for having staged, in the fifth song, God's wiping wounds, Aphrodite, first of all, whom Diomedes hurts, then Ares. They add to this all the stories that Diane reports, by way of consolation, on other misfortunes that had previously happened to the gods. For each of these particular grievances, we will give the explanation, which never leaves the philosophical domain. Diomede, having for ally Athena, that is to say wisdom, wounds Aphrodite, the unreason, who is not a goddess, not by Zeus, but only the thoughtlessness of the barbarian fighters. He, Diomedes, who explored the science of war in all directions, both in Thebes and in Ilion, where for ten years he showed his prudence in the front ranks of the battle, Diomedes has no difficulty in the barbarians away. These latter, without perspicacity and little familiar with reflection, allow themselves to be pursued by Diomede, like sheep in a rich man's enclosure. Many are massacred, and this is why Homer presents, in allegorical form, the barbarous unreason wounded by Diomedel. Homeric Problems 31. Likewise, Ares is nothing other than war. It takes its name of a which precisely means damage. We can have proof of this in the fact that Homer calls Ares this madman, this dizzy, this cursed breed. These qualifiers used by the poet are much better suited to war than to a divinity. All men in battle are overflowing with fury. In their fever of carnage, they no longer own themselves. For the qualifier alloprosalos, stunned, versatile, Homer explains it at greater length elsewhere, Always Enyalios is the same for all, by him, such who killed in his turn is killed. Nemesis tilts the scales in both directions, at war. It is not rare that the vanquished, even without a new encounter, suddenly finds himself victorious. The fortunes of battles being thus changing, and sometimes favoring some, sometimes others, it is with accuracy that the poet says, a versatile evil, thinking of war. Moreover, that Ares was wounded by Diomedes in the hollow of his flanks, at the very bottom, and not elsewhere, is extremely likely. Diomedes infiltrated a void left by the enemy on his not entirely covered, and he easily routed the barbarians. When Homer calls Ares, bronze, he is referring to the weapons of the combatants. Iron was scarce in those ancient times, we protected ourselves only with brass. What makes the poet say, the eyes are dazzled, so sparkle is the brass of the shining helmets, the polished breastplates. Ares, wounded, utters a loud cry, a cry like that uttered in battle by 9,000 or 10,000 men. This is proof that a large number of fleeing enemies are involved. Such a clamor could not come from a god alone. It comes, I imagine, from the innumerable army of rooted Trojans. Thus we have shown, with very clear arguments, and taking things point by point, that the character wounded by Diomedes is not Ares but the war. Homeric Problems 32. But here is what digresses in the course of the previous allegories and thanks to what they receive a sort of confirmation, 
with even greater ingenuity. It is the following passage. He suffered, Ares, when he was chained with a strong bond by Forta Philter and by his brother Otos, both sons of Alois. These young men, of generous courage, do not saw around him only disturbances and war. No truce had intervened to bring some relaxation to the sufferings of all kinds, so they took up their arms, set out on the campaign and put an end to this detestable situation. For thirteen months there was peace and union in their house, peace reigned, and concordal. A mother-in-law came along, and with her a real scourge of strife entered the house, which upset this fine order of old. A similar disturbance was seen reappearing for the second time, and it was believed that Ares, that is to say the war, had been released from his prison. Homeric Problems 33 We must not see in Heracles a man whose powerful physical constitution would have made a champion of strength in those days. He was a sage, initiated into celestial science, and who made philosophy shine with vivid brilliance. Plunged if one can say in a thick fog. It is also the opinion accepted by the most illustrious Stoics. All the works of Heracles subsequent to the Homeric tradition are beyond our scope and we will not try to explain him at length. The boar which he preyed upon is intemperance customary to men. The lion is the instinctive inclination that leads us to evil. In the same vein, for having hindered the unreasoning impulses of the heart, he was considered to have chained the bull full of superb ones. He cast out cowardice, the doe of Keraniah, out of life. Strictly speaking, it is not a struggle that endured the day when he made the big heap of manure disappear, the disgusting state in which humanity was languishing. The birds he scattered are the hopes flying in the wind, which devour our lives. And insolence with many heads, which, when beheaded, began to be reborn, he suppressed it like a hydra, burning it in the fire of his exhortations. As for Cerberus with the three chiefs, whom he brought to the light of day, he certainly represents philosophy and its three parts, which are called logic, physics, and morals. They are born, one might say, from a single trunk, but form three distinct heads. Homeric Problems 34. I have just explained in short, as I had announced, the meaning of these different works not mentioned in the poems. Homer introduces us to Hera wounded by Heracles. By this he wants us to hear exactly this, the thick air, placed like a fog in front of everyone's intelligence, Heracles was the first to clear it up, thanks to the lights of divine reason, by his numerous recommendations, he inflicted so many wounds on the ignorance of each man. This is the reason why he shoots his arrows from the earth to the sky. Every philosopher, indeed, without going out of his mortal and earthly body, sends his spirit, like a winged line, towards the higher regions. The poet added a learned precision. He struck her with a three-pointed arrow. He wanted to designate with one word the three branches of philosophy with this three-pointed arrow. Then it is Hades who, in broad daylight, is wounded. This is because there is no ground where philosophy does not penetrate. After having studied the sky, it extends its research to the lowest part of the universe, to be initiated even into the things of the underworld. Hades without light, Hades inaccessible to all humans, the arrow of wisdom, launched straight to the goal, was able to discern it well. Thus, the hands of Heracles are not defiled with any crime against Olympus. He is, in an allegorical representation, the great initiator of all wisdom. He delivered to posterity, so that they could draw from them in detail, all the philosophical discoveries he made the first. Homeric Problems 35 some think that Homer does not even consider Dionysus as a god. He has him pursued by Lycurgus, and seems to save him only barely, by the assistance of Thetis. This is an allegory, that of the harvest of wine among the peasants. Here is the text, one day he pursued, on the Saint Nision, the nurses of the delirious Dionysus. Altogether on the ground they throw their thyrses, under the blows of the sting of the murderer Lycurgus. As for Dionysus, he plunges, fleeing, into the waves of the sea. Their Thetis in his arms received him full of fear. Under the name of Dionysus, it is the wine that he calls delusional. And in fact, those who abuse this drink see their reason falter. He likewise calls, on occasion, fear, green, and war, bitter is resin. The effects which they make us experience, 
he transfers them to the causes which produce them. Lycurgus, owner of land planted with good vines, leaves at the end of summer, when they are picking the fruits of Dionysus, on the very fertile slopes of Nyssa. The nurses that he violates, we must think that they are the vines. Then, while the grapes are still being picked, here, says the poet, Dionysus, who fled in fear. This is because fear usually turns the spirits upside down, and the bunches of grapes, when crushed, turn into wine. In addition, it is the custom, in most countries, to preserve wine without alteration, to mix sea water in it. This is what the answer is. Dionysos plunged into the waves of the sea. There, Thetis in his arms received it. It is about the last operation after the pressing of the bunches. The sea water is indeed the last to receive the wine. Full of dread refers to the bubbling of sweet wine, at the beginning, when it has just been pressed, and to the agitation which transmutes it. It is this tremor that Homer called fear. Thus Homer knows, in allegorical form, not only to expose philosophical speculations, but also to deal with agricultural work. Homeric Problems 36. The poet sketches another physical exposition when he shows us Zeus bringing together all the gods to prelude to his great threats, on the highest peak of steep Olympus. He presents himself first, it is because the highest region, as we have seen, is held by the ethereal element. Has he tied a gold chain to the ether? that connects to the whole universe. And indeed, the scientists competent in these matters think that the revolutions of the stars are trails of fire Homer has also traced for us, with a simple line, the spherical shape of the world, as low below Hades as the sky is distant from the earth. Right in the middle of the universe, like a hearth and playing the role of center, is solidly seated the terrestrial mass. Forming a circle above it, the sky, in its eternal revolution, continues, from rising to setting, its endless course, dragging the sphere of fixed stars. Now all the straight lines drawn from the highest outer circle to the center, and, all the straight lines drawn, in the other direction are equal to each other. This is why the poet, doing geometry here, traced the spherical shape, of the world, saying, as low below Hades as the sky is distant from the earth. Homeric Problems 37. There are people ignorant enough to still reproach Homer, on the subject of prayers, for having so outrageously lent these daughters of Zeus a mask of ugliness and deformity. Because of the great Zeus there are girls, the prayers, who, lame, wrinkled and cross-eyed with both eyes. Now in these lines it is the attitude of the supplicants that is portrayed. Awareness of fault, in all these culprits, is slow to come and it is with difficulty that the petitioners advance towards those they implore, measuring, to the letter, the extent of their confusion. Their gaze is uncertain, they turn away their eyes and carry them back. But above all, their soul does not put on their forehead the red of joy. Pale and dull, it calls for pity at the first glance. So it is with good reason that Homer presents to us, not the daughters of Zeus, but the supplicants lame, wrinkled, cross-eyed with both eyes. The fault, on the other hand, is sturdy, she has good legs. What power indeed, in the madness of the latter, full of thoughtless ardor, like a runner, she thought only of pouncing on all injustices. So Homer, like a painter of human passions, gives allegorical names of divinities to what we experience. Homeric Problems 38. As for the Greek wall, this rampart which they had occasionally erected for their safety, I do not believe that it was their ally Poseidon who demolished it. Some torrential rain occurred, the rivers of overflowed Ida, and the wall happened that was overthrown, and was made responsible for the Poseidon case, which presides over the liquidity element. It is still probable that the structure collapsed under the tremors of the earthquakes. But common opinion wants to put on Poseidon, the shaker of the ground, the god who shakes the earth, the responsibility for these kinds of disasters. But thus the poet says to us the shaker of the ground, the trident in his hand, directed all himself. He carried away in waves the foundations, beams and stones, which the Argens had scarcely laid. It had caused some earthquake that shook the foundations of the wall from the depths. Looking closely, 
I find that the very detail of the trident is not without significance, that trident with which Homer lifts the stones from the wall. There are phenomena which differ, by the effect produced, from common earthquakes, but which physicists declare to be fundamentally identical. They give them particular names and call them, brasmati, vertical shake, chasmati, crevasse, climati, oblique shake. So it is a three-pointed weapon that Homer lent to the god who caused the earthquakes. As well, that Poseidon made a brief movement, and here trembling the great mountain and the woods, the poet has well specified to us there the characteristics of earthquakes. Homeric Problems 39. They, the enemies of Homer, still see a perfectly ridiculous story and a vast joke in Zeus's untimely sleep on Ida, and in this layer stretched out on the mountain, as for beasts, this layer where Zeus makes himself the slave of the two most animal requirements, love and sleep. I believe that all of this represents, in allegorical form, the spring season, when all the vegetation, all the greenery springs from the earth, while the icy cold slowly withdraws. He introduces us to Hera, that is to say the air, gloomy and sad still at the end of winter. That's why, I imagine, her heart is full of fear, and it is very likely. But soon, shaking off this cloud of sadness, from her desirable body, with ambrosia she first erases all dirt. Then she takes a pleasant and divine oil scented to her taste. It is the fat and fruitful season, with the scent of flowers, which Homer intends to describe by this anointing of Hera rubbing oil. He adds that she arranges her hair in braids that shine with a magnificent and divine radiance has his immortal forehead it is the growth of vegetation that he describes in covert words thus. Every tree, in fact, has a hair, and we can easily assimilate the leaves that hang from the twigs to hair. The bosom of spring the embroidered ribbon, where a desire, tenderness and amorous words, because this season is that of the year which lavishes on us the most delicious lot of pleasures, then we do not suffer neither excessive coldness nor too much heat. A happy medium, born of the happy mixture of one and the other, brings relaxation to our bodies. This air, Homer, a little further, makes it unite with the ether. This is why Zeus is on the highest peak of the mountain where through the air, one, arrives with ether. In this place the air and the ether mingle and merge. The poet therefore expressed himself very clearly with these words. At these words the cronide in his arms takes his wife. The ether which surrounds it with its circle indeed embraces the underlying air. From their union and their mixture, the poet described the result. The spring season, under them the divine soil gives birth to a tender grass where saffron, hyacinth and fresh lotus mingle, a soft and tight carpet that supports them both in the above the ground. These are the characteristic ornaments of the cool season that is blossoming, when, after the ices of winter, the earth, until then barren and closed, reveals to the light the fruits which it hid in its bosom. And to confirm this better, he calls the lotus, fresh, literally, covered with dew, and this dew on the lotus is the more than obvious mark of the spring season. They surround themselves with a beautiful golden cloud, from which a dew drops in sparkling drops. In winter, it is well known that the clouds, gathering in compact masses, take on a blackish tint, a thick fog is added to it, and the whole sky is dark and darkened. But when the air breaks them, the clouds, lightened, are gently penetrated by the rays of the sun which caress them, and they shine with reflections similar to those of gold. Here it is, the cloud that Homer fixed at the top of Ida, by recreating spring for us. Homeric Problems 40 but the audacity of his detractors reappears immediately to reproach him with the chains of Herol. They believe they find their abundant material for their ungodly fury against Homer. Do you not remember the day when, in the air, you remained suspended, when I had two anvils at your feet and held your hands in a chain of gold impossible to break? Yes, you remained there, suspended in the ether and among the clouds. They do not see that these verses are the theological exposition of the genesis of the universe, that the four elements, of which we speak constantly, their order of succession is marked in these verses, as I have already mentioned, first ether, secondly air, then water and earth, elements which are the last factors of all things, by combining together, 
they change into living things and are at the origin of inanimate beings. Zeus, therefore, the first, holds suspended the air which depends on him, and the two anvils fixed at the ends of the air are water and earth. And we will realize that it is indeed this, if we are willing, for each expression of the poet, to examine scrupulously its true meaning. Doesn't he remember the day you were suspended in the air? We are told there that it is hanging high in space, in the heavenly regions. I had clasped your hands in a golden chain, unbreakable. What does this new riddle mean, and this flattering punishment? How can an angry Zeus use such precious bonds to reduce to impotence the one he chastises? Why does he think of a gold link, instead of an iron bond, stronger? But precisely the zone where the air and the ether meet seems to be very close to the color of gold. It is therefore in all likelihood that at the place where the ether and the air meet, one which ends, the ether, and the other after him which begins, the air, the poet has assumed a gold chain. He adds, Yea, you dwelt there, suspended in the ether and among the clouds, thus giving the clouds as the lower limit to the air. At the ends of the air, which is called the feet, he suspended heavy masses, earth and water. I had at your feet two anvils hung. The link, how could the poet have said it, impossible to break, since Hera was delivered immediately, if the legend is to be believed. But because the harmony of the parts of the world is maintained by indestructible links, and the universe passes with difficulty to the opposite state, the poet has rightly called, impossible to break, what can never be disjointed. Homeric Problems 41. This series of the four elements Hera clearly designates them, a little further on, in his oaths, I attest to the earth and the infinite sky which extends over our heads, and this wave of the sticks which flows downwards. In the three invocations of her oath, she names beings of the same order as herself, the sister substances, water and earth, and the sky above, that is to say the ether. The fourth element is the author of the oath. Full of his subject and wishing to present in pretty pictures, in allegorical form, the elements in question, the poet makes them emerge a little further. In the words addressed by Poseidon to Iris, I, fate gave me to live forever in the white sea of foam. Hades received in bundle the misty darkness, and Zeus the vast sky, the ether and the clouds. But all three in common have the earth and the high Olympus. There is no question here, by Zeus, of the drawing of lots that the legend places in Circe one and of a division so strange that the sky would be placed there in parallel with the sea and Tartarus. All this account is an allegory on the four primitive elements. Homer gives the name of Kronos to the time, by changing a simple letter, I time is father of all things and it is absolutely impossible that any being comes to it. Existence without time, that is why it is the strain of the four elements. For mother, the poet assigns Rhea to them, since a sort of endless flow and movement is the law of the world. In time and in flow he gives for children earth and water, ether and the air that accompanies it. To the igneous substance he assigns heaven as his residence, he attributes the wet substance to Poseidon, Hades, the third, represents the dark air, and the earth, he shows it to us as the element common to all, and very stable, a kind of home for the manufacture of universe, but all three in common we have, the earth and the high Olympus. Homer's intention, I think, by multiplying the allegories on this subject, is to make us familiar, by dint of returning to it, the obscurity which seems to hover over these lines. Homeric Problems 42. With the tears of Zeus over Sarpedon, Homer did not unduly give grief to the divinity, making it share our human miseries. For months who want to find out what it is exactly, it is a question of a truth that the poet imagines to present in an allegorical turn. Many times, history tells us, during the great upheavals, prodigious signs appear on the earth. Waters of rivers and sources polluted by the contribution of waves soiled with blood, such as Oppos and Durke, to the testimony of ancient stories. It is also a question of clouds letting rain drops the color of bloodstains. Now here a turnaround in the combat was going to provoke a mass flight of the barbarians, and the end of Sarpedon, that hero of valor, was imminent. A sort of miracle thus appeared, heralding the disaster, he spreads a shower of blood on the earth. This bloody rain is allegorically called, Tears of the Ether, 
and not tears of Zeus, Zeus ignores tears. From the upper regions falls a violent rain, which seems to accompany funeral complaints. Homeric Problems 43. So far, perhaps, we have had only minor evidence of allegory, but with the manufacture of weapons, here is a grandiose, cosmogonic vision, where Homer has condensed the genesis of the universe. What are the first origins of this universe? What is its demiurge? How the various parts were separated from the mass? Homer exposes and demonstrates it clearly when he forges, with the shield of Achilles, an image of the cosmos and its circular form. And first he placed the making of the universe under the reign of night. As well, this one inherited the wings of time, like paternal privileges. And before the things we see now were separated, all was only night. What the poets call chaos, Homer could not make Hephaestus an unhappy, an unfortunate, whose hands would work without no of rest even at night. Whereas even among the miserable, here below, one finds it abnormal to toil without truce, day and night. No, Hephaestus forging his armor to Achilles, it is not that. And there are no mountains of bronze and tin, gold and silver in the sky. The sorrowful greed that the earth suffers from cannot have ace in heaven. Homer speaks like a physicist, he first showed that when matter was only a shapeless block, night reigned. The time has come to shape all things. He prepares for this work Hephaestus, that is to say the hot essence. According to the physicist Heraclitus, in fact, it is against fire that everything is exchanged. Not without plausibility, the poet gives Charis, grace, pleasure. As a companion to the constructor of the universe, the world should find pleasure in seeing itself become a world. But what are the materials of the divine builder? He throws hard bronze and pewter into the fire. If he had made an armor for Achilles, everything had to be gold. For my part one would find Achilles very miserable, not to reach in magnificence the level of a glaucos he it is actually a mixture of the four elements. Homer called the substance of the ether gold. Silver the substance which is very similar to this metal by its very coloring, air. Water and earth are called bronze and tin because of their density together. With these elements, he first forges the shield, which has a spherical shape. With this shield, Homer clearly indicates to us the world, which he knows from this very passage of the making of weapons, but we also have other evidence of it, that it is round in shape. Homeric Problems 44. In a brief digression we will give some demonstration in order. He continually calls the sun a karmas, elector, hyperion, by these qualifiers, he indicates nothing other than this spherical form. A karmas, he is the one who does not tire. It is apparently that he is not confined between the rising and the setting, but constrained relentlessly to a circular course. For elector, of two things one. Either this name means the god, who ignores the bed, a or electros, who never touches a layer, or again, and this is more probable, he is the one, who rolls in cyprail on our heads, epihelicta, and who, in his circular movement, day and night, goes around the world. By Hyperion, we must understand, he who passes eternally over the earth, Xenophanes of Colophon, if I am not mistaken, is expressed in the same way, the sun which passes up there and warms the earth. If Homer had wanted to give the sun his patronymic name, he would have called it, Hyperionid, as he occasionally calls Agamemnon, Atrides, and Achilles, Pelide. Homeric Problems 45. As for the un, rapid, night, it means nothing other than the spherical shape of the whole sky. The night, in fact, follows the same course as the sun, and all the space abandoned by it is immediately invaded by its darkness. The poet indicates this clearly in another place when he says, At this moment the luminous radiance of the sun falls in the ocean, on the fertile earth bringing black night. The night is as if attached to the sun, which drags it behind it, both walking at the same speed. Homer therefore rightly calls it the fast night, but one can also, and with more probability, metaphorically interpret this word un, spinning in a point, and think that it refers, not to the speed of the night, but to its form. Indeed, the poet says somewhere else, from there, I set sail for the pointed islands. The poet did not want to speak here of the speed of these well-rooted islands, that would be foolishness. He meant that their outlines formed a figure which ended at an acute angle. 
It is therefore normal that the night is called pointed, since the end of its shadow ends in a point. Homeric problems 46. By relying on this, we demonstrate, scientifically, that the world is spherical. According to mathematicians, casting shadows can take three forms. When the surface from which the light radiates is smaller than the illuminated surface, the shadow is shaped like a basket, kalathos, and widens towards the base. It is thinner at the top, at its starting point. When the illuminating light is larger than the illuminated area, the shadow takes the form of a cone, broad at the starting point and tapering to its end. Finally, when the illuminating surface and the illuminated surface are equal, the shadow is like a cylinder, the width of which is the same at each end. Homer wants to show that the sun is much larger than the earth, as most philosophers think. He therefore rightly calls the night, acute, or ending in a point at its end. It is, I imagine, that its shadow could not be projected neither in basket nor in cylinder, but in cone, according to the time-honored expression. By insinuating it, the first, with the help of this simple word, tho, Homer had already settled a thousand debates of philosophers. Homeric problems 47. The movements of contrary winds clearly prove the sphericity of the world. Bore, which blows from the north, from the height of the air rolls the enormous wave. The tide which moves from the upper regions to the lower regions, the one word verse has rolled it down its slope. Conversely, with regard to the notos which blows from the lower regions, the poet expresses himself thus, there the notos against the bare rock pushes the enormous wave. The flow transported from a place below to a higher place, it rolls upwards. Here is another proof which is added to the others. Homer calls the earth, infinite, and on the other hand he makes Hera say, I am going to the borders of the fertile earth, to visit these are not two contradictory opinions, putting the poet at odds with himself, but any object of spherical form is at the same time infinite and limited, because it has a delimitation and a contour, it can be considered with good reason as limited, but one can also say of a circle that it is without limits, since it is impossible to show the point where it ends, what one considered as the end could as well be the beginning. Homeric Problems 48. There you go an accumulation of evidence showing that Homer's world is spherical, but the clearest evidence is in the symbolic fabrication of Achilles' shield. The weapon that Hephaestos forges is circular in shape. It is like an image of the outline of the world. If Homer saw only one fiction in this shield engraved by Hephaestos, he had motifs adapted to Achilles engraved from one end to the other who were they. They soon arrive, and on the banks of the river, they engage in the fight. Brass javelins fly back and forth. Within the battle we see war and tumult and the cruel trapers, which seizes in turn a wounded fighter, but still alive, another without injury, another already dead, whom he drags by the feet through the fight. Such was indeed the existence of Achilles all day long. But Homer, a philosopher in his own way, traces the creation of the world, and first of all he forges the greatest works of providence, works which succeed indistinct and confused matter. In it he shows the earth and the sky and the sea, the tireless sun and the full moon. The destiny which presides over the genesis of the world first of all hammers the fundamental part, the terrell. On it he places the sky like a divine roof, and in the sinuosities offered by its relief, it pours, all in one mass, the sea. And immediately, with the sun and the moon, it illuminates the separate elements of the ancient chaos. And the stars, all those with which the sky is crowned. It is there, especially, that Homer presents the world to us as spherical. Just as the crown is a circular ornament for the head, so the stars, which surround the celestial vault, scattered in space in the shape of a sphere, are very aptly called, crown of the sky. Homeric Problems 49. Following these remarkable details on all the stars, he makes particular mention of a few very prominent constellations. He could not name all these divine bodies, like Eudoxus or Aratos, his intention being to write the Iliad and not the phenomena. He therefore turns to the allegory of the two cities, and presents us that of peace and that of war. Thus Empedocles of Agrigento could not draw the theories of the Sicilian school elsewhere than in Homer. At the same time as the four elements, Empedocles, 
in the presentation of his physics, introduces the struggle and the friendship. It is to them that Homer alludes while forging the cities of his shield, one of peace, which corresponds to friendship, the other of war, which corresponds to struggle. Homeric Problems 50. If he put five plates on the shield, it is for the simple reason that he wanted, without the aid of patterns applied to the cosmos, to denigmatically designate zones. The most northerly takes place around the boreal pole. It is called the Arctic zone. The next one is temperate. The third is called the torrid zone. The fourth, like the second, of which I have just spoken, is called temperate. The fifth bears the name of the southern part of the world. It is the southern Antarctic zone. Two of these areas are completely uninhabited. Because of the cold, that of the North Pole and that of the South Pole, two on the other end. Similarly another of them, the torrid zone, because of the excessive heat, is not accessible to any living being. On the other hand, the temperate zones, as they say, are inhabited, benefiting from an average temperature between their two neighbors. Eratosthenes, in his Hermes, explained it very well, in the following terms, five belts, zones, were wrapped around him two of them darker than the blue of the smalt, a withered and fiery red, all darting with flames, as she rests on the bitch herself, the rays of the ether overwhelm her with their fires, the last two, which, on both sides, around the pole are fixed, remain forever frozen, the water makes them forever suffer. Homeric Problems 51. These are the areas that Homer calls layers, or plates, when he says, the lame, in fact, formed it of five plates, two of bronze first, below, lila, inward, two of tin, then one of gold. The two most distant zones, located in the dark confines of the universe, are assimilated to bronze. This metal is cold, its contact is icy. Homer says somewhere else, and the cold bronze remains between his clenched teeth. One of gold, it is the torrid zone, fire, by its color, is it not very close to gold? Two tin inside, he wants to make the temperate zones heard. It is a flexible material than that of tin and very easy to work. By this the poet underlines the soft and lenient character for us of these two zones. And this is how the sacred workshop of Hephaestos, in the sky, created holy nature. Homeric Problems 52. But I immediately see the detractors of Homer rise up, with their appalling, irreducible malevolence, about the battle of the gods. This is not no more with our poet to unleash the atrocious melee between Trojans and Achaeans. Troubles and dissensions break out in heaven itself and make their prey to the divinity. Facing King Posidon walks Apollo Phoebos, holding his winged features. In front of Athena, the goddess with purse eyes, stands Enyalios. In front of Hera takes place Artemis the noisy, sister of the archer, goddess with the golden bow, with sure features. In front of Letu, it is the auspicious and strong Hermes, and in front of Hephaestos soars the great river with deep whirlpools. It is no longer Hector fighting against Ajax, nor Achilles against Hector, nor Sarpedon with Patroclus. Homer organized the great war from heaven and he does not stop the battle when the plague is unleashed, he puts the gods grappling and throws them against each other. Ares falls and on the ground he covers seven arpents. The dust immediately soiled her hair. Then it was Aphrodite who felt her heart and her knees fail. Artemis, for her part, is outrageously struck with her own bow, like an unwise little girl who is being corrected. And the Xanthus has almost ceased to be a river and to flow, by the fact of Hephaestos. Homeric Problems 53. What about all these stories? Without doubt it is, from the outset, quite impossible that they forcefully entail the adhesion of the great number. But whoever will want to descend a little deeper into the Homeric mysteries and be initiated into the contemplation of their secret wisdom, will realize that these stories, in which he believed to see an impiety, are rich in philosophy. Some want the meeting of the seven planets in the same sign of the zodiac to have been mentioned by Homer in this passage. It is universal destruction, when it happens. Homer would therefore like to make this confusion of all the elements heard, by bringing together Apollo, that is to say the sun, Artemis, which is for us the moon, the star of Aphrodite, that of Ares, and finally that of Hermes and that of Zeus. This allegory, which is more of fiction than truth, 
we have exposed it only so as not to appear to ignore it. There is a better explanation. In connection with the wisdom of Homer, this is the side that must be looked at. Homeric Problems 54. Homer, in truth, opposed vices and virtues, and made the elements struggle with their opposites. Immediately the gods are coupled for the battle according to these philosophical views, Athena and Ares, that is to say madness and wisdom. The first, I have said, is a fool, a cursed brood, a fool. The second is that of which all the gods praise the spirit and the tricks. Now an irreducible hatred opposes reason, which always takes the best decisions, and madness which sees nothing. The first, of such precious help in life, was no less effective on the battlefield. In its madness and fury, stupidity could not overcome intelligence. Athena triumphs over Ares and laid him down on the ground. This is because vice always crawls on the ground and throws itself into the shallows. It is a breed which is trampled underfoot, which is the butt of all outrages. Homer, near Ares, causes Aphrodite, or unbridled passion to stretch out. Both are stretched out on the fertile earth, these two twin wounds of the soul, so similar in their effects. Homeric Problems 55. In front of Letu stands Hermes. Hermes is nothing but the word, expressing what we feel inside of us. But the word is still opposed by Leto. Let us hear Letho, forgetting, by simply changing a letter, forgotten thing can no longer be announced. This is how we make memory the mother of the muses. We mean that the goddesses responsible for discourse are born at the bottom of memory. It is therefore normal that oblivion rushes forward to fight against its adversary. That this last yields to him, it is only justice. Forgetting is a defeat of the speech. And the most striking truth, by the fact that one loses the memory of it, is defeated and buried in a heavy silence. Homeric Problems 56. For the remaining gods, but rather a struggle between the forces of nature. Facing the king Poseidon, Apollo walking Phoebos. He opposes fire to water, naming the sun Apollo and the wet substance Poseidon. How much do these two forces contradict each other, need I even say. The one ceaselessly dominates the other by destroying it, but the poet, translating the reality finely, interrupts their fight. The sun, as we have shown, feeds on moist substance, especially salty substance. It aspires to the earth, without being seen, the humidity of its vapors and it is with this above all that it feeds its fire. The spectacle was painful of the infant grappling with its nurturer, that is why they gave in to each other. Homeric Problems 57. In front of Hera takes place Artemis the Loud, goddess with the golden ark, with sure features. Another scene which is not a gratuitous invention. Hera, I have said, represents the air, and the poet names Artemis the moon. There is always enmity between two beings, one of which cuts the other. So Homer makes the moon the enemy of the air, alluding to the movement and the course of this star in the air. A speedy defeat of the moon is to be expected. The air is immense and everywhere in space. The moon is smaller, constantly obscured by atmospheric phenomena. Once it is eclipses, again the fog and the clouds which intercept its light. So Homer gives the prize of victory to the greater of the two, to the one who continually harms the other. Homeric Problems 58. And before Hephaestus goes the great river with its deep whirlpools, speaking to us about Apollo and Poseidon, he introduced us to the celestial ether and the pure flame of the sun. Now he comes to the deadly fire and pits it against a river, confronting these two opposing substances in a fierce struggle. Previously, he made the sun give way before Poseidon. This time he causes the moist substance to succumb to the igneous substance. This last element is in fact more powerful than the other. Who then is foolish enough to put in these various scenes of the fighting gods, whereas Homer exposed there in the form of allegory the divine truths of nature? Homeric Problems 59. At the end of the Iliad, in a very clear allegory, Homer shows us Hermes taking a visible form to accompany Priam. Nothing seems persuasive enough to angry men, neither silver, nor gold, nor the most lavish gifts. But there is a gentle and peaceful way to influence others, persuasion by speaking. Euripides says very rightly, 
The only sanctuary of persuasion is the word. With words, Priam puts on a powerful armor. It is above all through this that he will break Achilles' anger. He does not show at the beginning of the twelve dresses, the twelve inlined plaids and other gifts he has worn. But the first accents of his prayer were able to soften Achilles' male fury. Remember your father, Achilles equal to the gods. The same age as me, now he is on the cursed threshold of old age. Court exordium, who conquered Achilles, Priam has almost disappeared before Peleus. For this Achilles takes pity on the old man, even inviting him to his table. And the body of Hector, bathed and washed, is returned to him. Such is the power of the word, interpreter of feelings. The word which Homer sent to Priam to assist him in his supplication. Homeric Problem 60. Is it not enough that throughout the Iliad the uninterrupted song of Homeric wisdom rises, expressing the truth about the gods in allegories? Will we go further and after so much evidence can we think that we still lack appealing to the Odyssey? It is true that we are always insatiable with beauty. Let's move on from the battles and wars of the Iliad to this moral work. That is the Odyssey, nor is it without philosophical resonances. We find Homer similar to himself in his two works. He does not tell anything indecent about the gods. No, he abstains from such a practice but speaks to us a mysterious language. Homeric Problems 61. From the beginning of the poem, we find Athena sent by Zeus to Telemachus, and this is very well explained. Telemachus, until then too young, has just passed his twentieth year and is in the process of becoming a man. He begins to realize things and feels that he must no longer endure the debauchery of the suitors, who are in their fourth year. These reflections which throng in the mind of Telemachus, the poet makes, allegorically, an apparition of Athena. She comes, borrowing the form of an old man, Mentes, well known as an old guest of Odysseus. Grey hair and old age, sacred havens of the last years, are for men a sure wetting, and the more the strength of the body diminishes, the more the thought gains in vigor. Homeric Problems 62. What lessons will Telemachus give to Telemachus, after his discreet entry, intelligence, without the presence of a goddess who came to sit beside him and address the exhortations that the text carries to him, while he plays tokens, come on, Telemachus, she said to him, you now have a little more sense than a little boy, equip the best of twenty or boats, and hear about your long father the first thought which arises in him, as soon as he emerges from the profound recklessness of young age, is a thought of justice and filial piety, he has no right to spend his time. Days in inaction, in Ithaca, forgetting the one who begot him. If he loves his father right away, he must prepare a ship and go, running the seas, on the news of Ulysses, to find the lost track of the traveller. The second question he examines is knowing where to go to inquire about the fate of the father. He hears wisdom seated by his side blowing him. Go first to the divine Nestor, to Pylos, then to Sparta, to the blonde Menelaus. The first had the experience of old age, the second had just returned after having wandered eight years. It is the last to return of all the Achaeans with the bronze coat. Nestor was therefore to be useful to him by his advice, and Menelaus tell him the truth about Ulysses' wandering races. Homeric Problems 63. While thinking of this, he said to himself, as if giving himself a light slap, leave the children's games, it is no longer your age. Like a teacher and a father, reflection awakens in him the sense of responsibility. Then, bringing the comparison with a courageous adolescent of her age, she urges him to show equal wisdom. Listen to the fame that all humans had for the divine Orestes, from the day he had killed his father's murderer. Raised by such reflections, we understand that he feels his thought, light, leaving at this moment in the air. Homer compares it to a bird, like a seabird disappeared in space. The wisdom of Telemachus, very proud, one would say, to carry such a rich treasure within her, here she is standing up. Very quickly the assembly is reunited, and Telemachus uses the language of fatherly eloquence. The preparations for the sea trip are made by a character with an allegorical name, the son of Phronios, Noamon. These two words simply designate the thoughts which suddenly come to Telemachus. When he boarded the ship, 
Athena climbed up beside him, again taking on the appearances of mentor, mentor, the man who, in difficulties, resorts to reflection, mother of wisdom. Through all these episodes, it is the progressive development of intelligence in Telemachus that the poet tells us. Homeric Problems 64. The story of Proteus, which Menelaus develops so at length, at first glance offers a deceptive appearance. Is it not pure fiction, that an unfortunate man inhabiting this small island of Egypt, dragging his sentence eternally, dividing his life between the sea and the land, sleeping, the unfortunate, in the company of the seals, so that his very joys may be poisoned. His daughter, Idithea, favors a stranger at the expense of her father whom she betrays. Add again these chains and the ambush of Menelaus. Then the metamorphoses of this Proteus with a thousand faces, taking all the forms he wants. So many features that have all the air of tales made for pleasure and phantasmagoric, unless a celestial soul comes to initiate us into these mysteries of Olympus, which are played out in Homer. Homeric Problems 65. Well, the poet presents to us the distant origins of all things. The roots, from which the universe emerged to constitute itself as it is today we see it. Formerly there was a time when there was only a shapeless or silty mass, matter had not yet reached, by receiving distinct features, the perfection of form. The earth, home of the universe, did not yet have a solid and well-established center. The sky did not turn either, stabilized in its eternal movement. All was desert without sun and black silence. Nothing else existed but matter in a confused state. Formlessness and inertia reigned, until the day when the principal craftsman of all things and generator of the world ensured the protection of life and gave the cosmos its imprint of order and beauty. He divided heaven and earth, and divided the continent from the sea. The four elements, roots and germs of all things, received, in turn, their own form. By carefully mixing these various elements, the god whereas nothing was distinct in formless matter. Homeric Problems 66 the daughter of Proteus is rightly called Idithi, goddess of form, since she is the divinity who presides over the appearance of the various forms. And this is why Proteus, first of all, divides and takes several forms, under the action of providence which models him. He first changes into a maned lion, then he becomes a dragon, a panther and a giant pig. There is running water and a large plume tree. The lion, an animal full of fire, designates the ether. The dragon is the earth. This is the only reason why it is said to be indigenous and born of the earth. As for the tree, which grows in all directions and constantly receives the thrust of the earth to rise into the sky, it designates air in a pictorial form. Water, it, and this to better assure us of the previous allegories Homer presents it more clearly, water, he makes running. So it is perfectly normal for formless matter to be called Proteus, and the providence which gave form to everything, Idithia, and of this double principle, the whole is divided, after separation, into these agglomerates which are the organizers of the universe. The island where this modeling takes place takes the name, very likely, of Pharos, since the verb Phersi means to produce, and that Callimachus calls a Pheratos, uneducated, virgin, the unproductive land, virgin as a woman. Homer therefore speaks like a physicist by naming Pharos the country which was the father of all things. With this name which evokes fertility, he marked what he most wanted to underline. Homeric Problems 67. Let us now examine what are the qualifiers with which he adorns Proteus. Here frequents an old man with Halios, truthful. It is, I think, the character of the original substance to be older, and this is how it gives to formless matter that prestige that time brings with white hair. By calling it Halios, he certainly does not mean a marine divinity, living in the midst of the waves, but what results from the aggregation, that is to say from the reunion of multiple and diverse elements. As for truthful, it is a very correct word, what better source of truth than this substance, of which we must believe that everything is born. The persuasive eloquence of Ulysses and his various speeches, Calypso calls it Hermes. The hero, although with great difficulty, ended up bewitching the loving goddess and obtained her dismissal in Ithaca. For this reason, 
Hermes arrives from Olympus in the form of a bird. Words, Homer tells us, are winged, and nothing in the world goes faster than words. Homeric Problems 68. I we must not neglect the secondary episodes also make us appreciate the delicacy of Homer's intentions. The loves of Hamera and Orion, decent little adventure, even for humans, are an allegory. This is how the rose-fingered dawn had once taken Orion. Homer presents to us here a young man still in the prime of his life and delighted by fate before the appointed hour. Now an ancient custom was that the bodies of the sick were not, after death, taken for the funeral, neither during the night, nor when the midday heat spreads over the earth, but at daybreak, when the rays of the rising sun do not yet burn. When a young man of both noble family and great beauty died, his funeral procession was euphemistically called abduction by Hemera, as if he was not dead, but only a amorous passion would have delighted her. This is said according to Homer. Jason, a man who was engaged in agriculture, and obtained from his fields an abundance of crops, was naturally passed to be loved by Demeter. Homer, as we can see, does not attribute to the divinities, in these accounts, either shameless love or disorderly conduct. On the contrary, he gives a glimpse of the most chaste goddesses that exist, Hemera and Demeter. Those who wish piously to seek, he directs them with precision towards the physical interpretation. Homeric Problems 69. We must now leave everything else to deal with an accusation that our sycophants keep coming back to and painfully harping on. They make a drama of the love affairs of Ares and Aphrodite, and proclaim in every tone that it is an ungodly fable. Homer gives right to debauchery city in heaven, and is not ashamed to blame the gods for a fault which, in men, when it occurs, is punished by death, adultery. The loves of Ares and his Aphrodite in the diadem, their first meeting in the house of Hephaestos, and all the rest, chains, laughter of the gods, intervention of Poseidon with Hephaestos. The disorders from which the gods suffer, one cannot punish, here below, the men who are guilty of them. For my part, I believe that these loves, although sung by the Phaeacians, slaves of pleasure, relate to some philosophical truth. Homer seems to confirm here the ideas of the Sicilian school and the theory of Empedocles, by naming Ares discord, and Aphrodite friendship. These two principles, originally separate, Homer shows us, after their old enmity, uniting in perfect harmony. Both, a very logical consequence, give birth to harmony, the universe having known a perfect and smooth harmony. It was natural for the gods to laugh at this spectacle, and for them to rejoice together, as long as their particular favors, ceasing to annoy each other in order to destroy each other, new peace in union. It can also be an allegory on the work of the forge. Ares may well designate iron. If Hephaestos mastered it without difficulty, is it because fire, endowed, I imagine, with a power greater than that of iron, easily softens the hardness of this metal in its flames? But the artist also needs Aphrodite for his design, which means, I think, that after having softened the iron with fire, he completed and succeeded his work with a delightful art. It is Poseidon who pulls Ares from the hands of Hephaestos, nothing more nor badly, since the mass of iron, drawn from the incandescent furnaces, is immersed in water and the incandescence, by the proper effect of this element, goes out and stops. Homeric Problem 70 all of Odysseus' wandering course, if we want to take a closer look, is but a vast allegory. Ulysses is like an instrument of all the virtues that Homer forged. Through him he teaches wisdom, for he hates the vices that ravage mankind. Pleasure, first of all, this lotophagous country, who cultivates an exotic enjoyment. Near her Ulysses passed by dominating himself. The savage outburst of each of us, he burned him, one might say, in the fire of his exhortations, and he blinded him. And this monster has named Cyclops, or the one who steals judgment. Ulysses, was it not he who, thanks to his knowledge of astronomy, was the first to know how to foresee the favorable moment for a crossing, and seemed to have made certain winds blow? And his victory over the poisons of Circe means that he has discovered, in his profound knowledge, the means of warding off the harmfulness of certain preparations of foreign origin. 
Wisdom descends as far as Hades, so as not to leave an unexplored area, even in the underworld. And who then listens to the sirens, learning from them the stories of all ages? Charybdis is a well chosen name for the spendthrift, insatiable debauchery of drinking. Scylla is the allegorical representation of impudence with a thousand faces. It is easy to understand, therefore, that it is surrounded by dogs, with muzzles bristling with rapacity, audacity, and lust. The oxen of the sun represent temperance. Hunger itself could not compel, the wise man, to injustice. These are undoubtedly tales for pleasure, intended for the listeners. But if these tales lead to wisdom, presented in allegories, they will be of the greatest help to anyone who draws inspiration from their examples. Homeric Problems 71. Aeolus, in my opinion, represents the year par excellence, linked to the twelve-month cycle that time imposes on it. Isn't his name Aeolus, that is to say, the variegated. And the year is precisely composed of parts whose duration and nature are not the same in each season. Various changes that occur each time make it a variegation. The rigors of the cold disappear before the smile of spring, all charged with sweet joys. The humidity of the spring season condenses under the scorching force of summer. Fall, the season of decline and annual harvests, draws the summer heat and preludes to winter. By giving birth to all this variegation, the year justifies the name of Aeolus, with changing reflections. Homer calls him the child of Hippotes. Are there any nothing effect that exceeds the liveliness of time? Is there anything so nimble, endlessly in motion, incessantly flowing? Its speed serves as a measure for the totality of the centuries. His twelve children are the twelve months, six daughters and six sons of manhood. The months which compose the summer, for their fertile and productive character, he likened them to female children, while the winter months, harsh and icy, he made them male. The story of their marriage is not immoral either, if he made brothers and sisters unite, it is precisely because the seasons are supported by each other. Eol is the manager of the winds. At his pleasure, he excites or calms them. Wind movements follow a monthly cycle, they blow at fixed periods. Is it the year that reigns supreme over all? Homeric Problems 72. This is, I believe, the physical meaning that must be given to the story of Aeolus. Circe's Kaikon represents the cup of pleasure. Intemperate drinkers drink from it and for the fleeting pleasure of gorging themselves, they condemn themselves to a life more miserable than that of pigs. So the companions of Ulysses, an imbecile troop, yield to gluttony, but the wisdom of Odysseus emerges victorious from this sensual life near Circe. Ulysses no sooner left his ship to go up to the palace than Hermes appeared to him, at the gates of Circe's manor, Hermes, that is to say the speech reasonable. We suppose, of course, that this name of Hermes conforms to reality, is it not like the interpreter of all that is thought in the soul? Painters and stonemasons make it square, because a language full of uprightness always has a solid foundation, without slipping or rolling from side to side. They attach wings to his forehead to symbolize the rapidity of speech. Hermes loves peace. In wars, speeches, more than anywhere else, are absent, and the strength of arms, the most often there is the last word. The qualifiers used by Homer, it seems to us, make the matter even clearer. He calls the god Archiphontes, not certainly that he knows the stories of Hesiod which cause Hermes to kill the herdsmen of Lo, but the word is the only reality which makes one see clearly the thought, this is why he calls Hermes, the one who makes one see clearly. Beneficent, protector, and still foreign to evil are the most perfect proof that it is about wise speeches. For reasoning is established apart from wickedness. He protects at all times the man who has recourse to him and he helps him a lot. But why then, in Homer, this god Hermes he receives a double series of honors at two distinct times, underground, as a Chthonian divinity, above our heads, as a heavenly deity. This is because speech has a double aspect. Interior word, as the philosophers say, and spoken word. The latter exteriorizes our intimate reflections, the former remains locked in the back of the courtyards. This last language, it is said, 
is also the one that the divinity employs. The gods, if they lack nothing, are satisfied with the voice of which they have the use. For this reason Homer calls Chthonian the inner word, invisible and drowned shadow in the depths of thought, and the word uttered, because it is visible from afar, he lodged it in the sky. The tongue, the only part of the body which is used for speech, is sacrificed to Hermes. Hermes is also the last to whom, before going to sleep, one makes libations. It is because sleep puts an end to all voice activity. Homeric Problems 73 Such then is the one who presents himself to Ulysses to advise him, while he is on his way to Circe. At the beginning, transported with anger and pain by what he has learned, he is in an irrational elation. But little by little these feelings fade, his judgment and the sense of his interest slowly emerge. Hence Hermes Chrysorapus introduced himself Chrysorin, gold, is taken here in the sense of beautiful, and raptane, to sow, has the metaphorical meaning of to compose, to think. Did not Homer say elsewhere, we have sown up their evils piece by piece. In the same sense he speaks of very tangled stories, because a word is brought by another, comes to be sown to Ella and obtains the desired result. Homer therefore calls the word excellent sewing machine, because of her ability to deliberate well and to sew together facts. This is how, succeeding thoughtless anger, the voice of reason makes itself heard in Ulysses, to reproach him for his useless eagerness. Where are you going, unhappy man, along these hills, all alone, and in those places you don't know? These words are those of Ulysses speaking to himself. He has reflected and changed his mind, mastering his first impulse. As for wisdom, it is quite normal to call it moly, as a monopoly of the human race, or because it comes to few people, not without harm. And this is its nature. The root is black, and the flower milk white. In general, for all goods of this nature, the beginnings are arduous and painful, but if one has the courage to bravely endure the difficulties of the beginning, it is very sweet in the light of the fruit of the precious results. Such is the reason which keeps Ulysses and assures him the victory over the drugs of Circe. Homeric Problems 74 Leaving these visions of the earth for the invisible and dead world, Homer is careful not to leave the latter outside his allegories, he also explains Hades to us, in his philosophy in symbols. The first river of the underworld bears the significant name of Cositis, lamentation, a name which designates human suffering, the complaint of the living mourning the dead. Homer calls the next Pyriphlegaton, after the tears come the funeral and the flame of the stake, which annihilates all that belonged in our being to the perishable flesh. Homer knows that these rivers both flow into Acheron, it happens that after the lamentations of the first hour and once the last duties have been completed, a lasting affliction and sorrow revive the feelings of pain at the slightest reminder. Is it from the sticks that the waters of these rivers fall, because of the dreary and gloomy nature of death? Hades, the invisible, is the very name of the obscure abode and Persephone, moreover, is the one who must destroy all beings, in her one does not see the young pear next to the aged pear, the apple on apple. The only trees that grow in their woods are poplars and willows with dead fruit. Are the sacrifices appropriate instead? Homeric Problems 75. When it enters into conjunction with the moons, the globe of the sun is obscured and veiled. We often see, then, stars twinkling. Nothing could be more normal, therefore, than these words of Theoclymene, the man who listens to heaven, for Homer has found a name for him in accordance with this scientific exposition. From head to knees, the night envelops you, it drowns your faces. Moreover, during eclipses, what we see is color of blood, since everything turns red. This is why he adds, I see blood flowing on the wall, in the beautiful niches. The date of eclipses, fixed by Hipparchus, is the 30th of the month, new moon, as they say, what is called among the Attic people, old and new moon, no other day is possible for eclipses. Now, when Theoclymene writes his story, what date are we? Homer himself will tell us, at the end of the month, at the beginning of the next. Such is the precision of Homer, as well for the circumstances as for the date of the eclipse what good, after all these considerations, 
to speak again of the assistance which Athena gives to Ulysses to consummate the massacre of suitors, Athena, that is to say wisdom. If he had fought openly and by force against his evil adversaries, war would have been the perfect aid to assist him. But as he circumvents them by cunning and skill, to overcome them without making himself known, it is thanks to intelligence that he succeeds. Through all these examples that we have gathered, we discover that Homer's work is full of allegories. Homeric Problems 76. Must it be after that that this great hierophant of heaven and the gods, Homer, the man who opened the paths leading to the heavens, until then inaccessible and closed to human souls, must he be condemned as a blasphemer? That as a result of this ungodly and odious sentence and after the disappearance of the poems, the stupor of ignorance may invade the world. So that the choir of little children no longer enjoys, above all else, the wise lessons of Homer, like milk drawn from a nursing mother. So that young boys and teenagers, so that old age on its decline will no longer have fun. That all mankind whose tongues might have been taken away should live in stupidity. That Plato should therefore exile Homer from his republic to himself, as he himself exiled himself from Athens in Sicily, but it would have been necessary first to drive out of this republic Crishes the tyrant, to drive out Alcibiades, who, acted as a woman, without any dignity, who, as a teenager, wanted to play the man, who parodied in his orgies the mysteries of Eleusis, the defector of Sicily, the author of Decelia but Plato may well banish Homer from his city, the whole universe proclaims itself the only homeland of Homer, in which city to register Homer as a citizen, he for whom all cities raise their hand, and in the first place Athens, after denying Socrates is one of her own, to the point of poisoning her, she has only one desire, to pass for the homeland of Homer. But would Homer have endured living under the laws of Plato, while they are both separated by such divergent and contradictory positions? One advises to put women and children in common, the other has his two poems all sanctified by wise unions. It is for Helena that the Greeks set out on a campaign, for Penelope that Ulysses wanders on an adventure. The Homeric city, such as it appears in the two poems, has the most just institutions which can govern human life. Plato's dialogues are dishonored at all times by the loves of young boys, there is not a man who is not possessed by unnatural desires. Homer invokes the muses, divine virgins, for the most illustrious achievements, when it is a question of a noble mission, worthy of the divine Homeric greatness, no less than to arrange the combatants by cities and to tell the exploits of this or that great hero. Homeric Problems 77. So, as we reach a familiar place, he takes his place on the helicon and cries out, Tell me now, muses who on Olympus have your home tell me who are among the Danans the guides and the leaders. Or again, when he undertakes to sing the bravery of Agamemnon and to celebrate this hero who looks like three gods united, muses who inhabit the mansions of Olympus, tell me now who stands first in front of the Atride. But Plato, the strange Plato, in his marvellous Phaedrus, at the beginning of his serious classification of various loves, had the same audacity as Ajax the Locran in the sanctuary of the most august goddess, to offer the muses sacrilegious libations for ask their wise assistance in favour of an immodest work. It is you whom I invoke, muses in the light voice, that you owe this nickname to the quality of your song or to some musical race hand, with me, this fiction. What is it, wonderful Plato, could I say, from the sky and the nature of the universe, or from the earth and the sea? Not and it is not a question either of the sun and the moon, of the movement of the planets and of the fixed stars. I am ashamed to say the ultimate reason for this invocation. There was once a very pretty young boy, or rather an adolescent, who had many lovers, and one of them, who was very cunning, had made him believe that he did not love her, while loving her. And one day when he asked for it, he told him this is how he exposes shamelessness before his eyes, without veils, as he would display it on a roof, without even mitigating the shame of the thing by a decent presentation. Homeric Problems 78. We have the right to conclude. Stories of Homer, biographies of heroes, dialogues of Plato, loves of boys. Everything in Homer breathes a noble virtue. Prudence of Odysseus, courage of Ajax, wisdom of Penelope, perfect justice of Nestor, 
filial piety of Telemachus, wonderfully faithful friendship of Achilles. Which of do we find these examples in the philosopher Plato? Unless, by Zeus, to proclaim glorious and useful, this solemn babble on ideas, which even Aristotle, his disciple, laughs at. Also, for his remarks against Homer was punished, quite rightly in my opinion, he who does not know how to retain his tongue, a disease of the most honorable. Like the Tantalus, Capony and all those to whom this disease of the tongue was worth a thousand trials. Many times he languished at the gates of tyrants. Free from birth, he had to endure the condition of a slave, until he was put up for sale. Everyone knows the name of the Spartan Polis, to whom nor the way in which our man was saved, thanks to the good heart of a Libyan, and estimated twenty mines, the price of a very ordinary slave. And that in punishment, well deserved, for the impious remarks launched against Homer by this language without break or door. Homeric Problems 79. I could continue this indictment against Plato, but I stop, out of respect for the name of Socratic wisdom. I go to Epicurus, the philosopher, Phaeacian, the man who cultivates pleasure in his private gardens, who judges all poetry, and not especially of Homer, by relying on the stars. What little he has leave it to the world, he must still have it brazenly steals from Homer, without knowing it. The words that Odysseus pronounced at Alcanor's, playing a comedy, are as insincere as they are wise. Procure takes them at serious and wants to place the hut of life. This life of a whole people in good harmony, when in the mansions we see the guests in long lines sitting down to listen to the aid, this is according to my liking the most beautiful of lives. Which Ulysses is talking about here? It is not the hero of Troy, nor the man who ravaged Thrace, nor the one who passed contemptuously close to the lotophagous pleasures, nor the one who, facing the great Cyclops, revealed himself to be even greater. It was not the man who trod under his feet the whole earth, who sailed through the ocean sea, who beheld the invisible kingdom alive, Hades. It is not this Ulysses who is speaking here, it is a poor wreck, which escaped the wrath of Poseidon, and which the raging waves threw to the pity of the Phaeacians. He is obliged to approve the kind of honored life with the hosts who have received it. He who had but one desire, which he expressed in his misery, make the Phaeacians welcome me as a friend and be pitiful to me, not being able to reform by his lessons the unethical conduct of the Phaeacians, he is constrained by the need to give him a good testimony. But this ignorant of Epicurus takes for the foundation of his morality what necessity has occasionally dictated to the hero, and what Ulysses, among the Phaeacians, declared the most beautiful, he plants in his venerable gardens. But hey from Epicurus, whose soul has, I believe, more diseases than the body. All generations have proclaimed the wisdom of Homer divine and as time advances his graces grow younger. Anybody only opens his mouth about it to say good things about it. Of his divine poetry we are all in an equal capacity the priests and the zealots. Let the one or two who form in vain, away from the archives from useless projects, perish with boredom.